Part 2. Prior to getting down to discussing the practical problems of setting up workers, peasants and soldiers' councils in Italy, and bearing in mind the general considerations contained in the article we published in our last issue, we wish to examine the programmatic guidelines of the Soviet system as they are developed in the documents of the Russian Revolution and in the declarations of principle issued by some of the Italian maximalist currents, such as the program adopted by the Bologna Congress, the motion proposed by Lyon, and other comrades to the same Congress, and the writings of Lordine Nuovo on the Turin Factory Council movement. The Councils in the Bolshevik Program In the documents of the Third International and the Russian Communist Party, in the masterly reports of those formidable exponents of doctrine, the leaders of the Russian revolutionary movement, Lenin, Zinoviev, Radek, Bukharin, there recurs at frequent intervals the idea that the Russian Revolution did not invent new and unforeseen structures, but merely confirmed the predictions of Marxist theory concerning the revolutionary process. The core of the imposing phenomenon of the Russian Revolution is the conquest of political power on the part of the working masses and the establishment of their dictatorship as the result of an authentic class war. The Soviets, and it is well to recall that the word Soviet simply means council and can be employed to describe any sort of representative body. The Soviets, as far as history is concerned, are the system of representation employed by the proletarian class once it has taken power. The Soviets are the organs that take the place of parliament and the bourgeois administrative assemblies and gradually replace all the other ramifications of the state. To put it in the words of the most recent Congress of the Russian Communists, as quoted by Comrade Zinoviev, the Soviets are the state organizations of the workers and poor peasants. They exercise the dictatorship of the proletariat during the stage when all previous forms of the state are being extinguished. In the final analysis, this system of state organizations gives representation to all producers in their capacity as members of the working class, and not as members of a particular trade or industrial sector. According to the latest manifesto of the Third International, the Soviets represent a new type of mass organization, one which embraces the working class in its entirety, irrespective of individual trades or levels of political maturity. The basic units of the Soviet administrative network are the urban and rural councils. The network culminates in the government of commissars. And yet it is true that during the phase of economic transformation, other organs are emerging parallel to this system, such as the system of workers' control and the people's economy. It is also true, as we have stressed many times, that this economic system will gradually absorb the political system once the expropriation of the bourgeoisie is completed and there is no further need for a central authority. But the essential problem during the revolutionary period, as emerges clearly from all the Russian documents, is that of keeping the various local and sectional demands and interests subordinate to the general interest in space and time of the revolutionary movement. Not until the two sets of organs are merged will the network of production be thoroughly communist, And only then will that principle, which in our view is being given exaggerated importance, of a perfect match between the system of representation and the mechanisms of the productive system be successfully realized. Prior to that stage, while the bourgeoisie is still resisting, and above all, while it still holds power, the problem is to achieve a representative system in which the general interest prevails. Today, while the economy is still based on individualism and competition, The only form in which this higher collective interest can be manifested is a system of political representation in which the communist political party is active. We shall come back to this question and demonstrate how the desire to over-concretize and technically determine the Soviet system, especially when the bourgeoisie is still in power, puts the cart before the horse and lapses into the old eras of syndicalism and reformism. For the moment, we quote these non-ambiguous words of Zinoviev. The Communist Party unifies that vanguard of the proletariat which is struggling, in conscious fashion, to put the Communist program into effect. In particular, it is striving to introduce its program into the state organizations, the Soviets, and to achieve complete dominance within them. To conclude, the Russian Soviet Republic is led by the Soviets, which represent 10 million workers out of a total population of about 80 million. But essentially, appointments to the executive committees of the local and central Soviets are settled in the sections and congresses of the great communist party, which has mastery over the Soviets. This corresponds to the stirring defense by Radek of the revolutionary role of minorities. It would be as well not to create a majoritarian workerist fetishism, which could only be the advantage of reformism and the bourgeoisie. The party is in the front line of the revolution insofar as it is potentially composed of men who think and act like members of the future working humanity, in which all will be producers harmoniously inserted into a marvellous mechanism of functions and representation. 
the Bologna program and the councils. It is to be deplored that in the party's current program there is no trace of the Marxist proposition that the class party is the instrument of the proletarian emancipation. There is just the anodyne codicil, decides. Who decides? Even Grandma was sacrificed in the haste to decide, in favour of elections. To base the organisation of the Italian Socialist Party on the above-mentioned principles. As regards the paragraph which denies the transformation of any state organ into an organ of struggle for the liberation of the proletariat, there are certain points to be made, but it will have to be done on another occasion, after an indispensable previous clarification of terms. But we dissent still more strongly from the program where it states that the new proletarian organs will function initially under the bourgeois regime as instruments of the violent struggle of liberation and will subsequently become organs of social and economic transformation. For among the organs mentioned are not only workers, peasants and soldiers councils, but also councils of the public economy, which are inconceivable under a bourgeois regime. Even the workers' political councils should be seen primarily as vehicles for the communist activity of liberating the proletariat. Even quite recently, Comrade Sarati, in flagrant opposition to Marx and Lenin, has undervalued the role of the class party in the revolution. As Lenin says, together with the working masses, the Marxist, centralized political party, the vanguard of the proletariat, will lead the people along the right road, towards the victorious dictatorship of the proletariat, towards proletarian, not bourgeois democracy, towards Soviet power and the socialist order. The party's current program smacks of libertarian scruples and a lack of theoretical preparation. The Councils and the Lyon Motion this motion was summarized in four points expounded in the author's evocative style. The first of these points finds miraculous inspiration in the statement that the class struggle is the real engine of history and that he has smashed social national unions. But then the motion proceeds to exalt the Soviets as the organs of revolutionary synthesis, which they are supposed to bring about virtually through the very mechanism of their being created. It states that only Soviets, rather than schools, parties or corporations, can bring the great historical initiatives to a triumphant conclusion. This idea of Leon's, and of the many comrades who signed this motion, is quite different from our own, which we have deduced from Marxism and from the lessons of the Russian Revolution. What they are doing is overemphasizing a form in place of a force, just as the syndicalists did in the case of the trade unions, attributing to their minimalist practices the magic virtue of being able to transform itself into the social revolution. Just as syndicalism was demolished in the first place by the criticism of true Marxists, and subsequently by the experience of the syndicalist movements which all over the world have collaborated with the bourgeois regime, providing it with elements for its preservation, so Lyon's idea collapses before the experience of the counter-revolutionary, social democratic workers' councils, which are precisely those which have not been penetrated successfully by the communist political program. Only the party can embody the dynamic revolutionary energies of the class. It would be trivial to object that socialist parties too have compromised, since we are not exalting the virtues of the party form, but those of the dynamic content which is to be found only in the communist party. Every party defines itself on the basis of its own program, and its functions cannot be compared with those of the other parties, whereas of necessity, all the trade unions, and in, even in a technical sense, all the workers' councils have functions in common with one another. The shortcomings of the social reformist parties was not that they were parties, but that they were not communist and revolutionary parties. These parties led the counter-revolution, whereas the communist parties, in opposition to them, led and nourished revolutionary action. Thus there are no organs which are revolutionary by virtue of their form. There are only social forces that are revolutionary on account of their orientation. These forces transform themselves into a party that goes into a battle with a program. The Councils and the Initiative of Zlodin Novo in Turin In our view, the comrades around the newspaper Lodi Nuovo, go even further than this. They are not even happy with the wording of the party's program, because they claim that the Soviets, including those of a technical economic character, the factory councils, not only are already in existence and functioning as organs of the proletarian liberation struggle under the bourgeois regime, but have already become organs for the reconstruction of the communist economy. In fact, they publish in their newspaper the section of the party's program that we quoted above, leaving out a few words so as to transform its meaning in accordance with their own point of view. They will have to be opposed by the proletarian organs, workers, peasants and soldiers' councils, councils of the public economy, etc. Organs of social and economic transformation and for the reconstruction of the new communist order. But this article is already a long one, so we postpone to our next issue the exposition of our profound dissension from this principle, 
In our view, it runs the risk of ending up as a purely reformist experiment involving modification of certain functions of the trade unions and perhaps the promulgation of a bourgeois law on workers' councils.